Hello, everybody. I certainly wish that I were there in person talking with you. I hope that it's a beautiful day wherever you are listening to this. And um, I wish that I wish that I were there and could take your questions while I'm giving this presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have via email. So I'm Karen Oberhauser. I'm the director of the University of Wisconsin Arboretum. And I'm talking with you today about monarch butterflies. I've spent most of my career since 1985 actually studying monarch butterflies and I'm really excited to share some of what I know today. So now I'm going to share my screen, monarch butterfly biology and conservation. So what I'm going to be doing is talking about some background on monarch biology and then focus on how we use what we know about monarch biology to inform conservation efforts for this species. Because I don't want to run out of time at the end of this, I'm going to make sure to right now thank all of the people who have worked with me on this research and, and everything else I do. And first of all, in the top of this slide, I have been at the University of Wisconsin for uh, a little over two years now, but before I was here, I came from the University of Minnesota, where I just had amazing students and staff members. So the, all of the people pictured out in this prairie are the last people I worked with at the University of Minnesota, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is based on work that many of these individuals conducted. And my new academic family is at the University of Wisconsin. This is our staff at the UW, and I will talk a little bit about the Arboretum at the end, just to kind of pull together what I'm doing now with what I used to do as a monarch butterfly biologist. And finally, I'd like to thank citizen scientists and all the other people I've collaborated on besides my students and other people I've worked directly with but mostly citizen scientists. And the two people in the bottom right on my slide are actually my parents, Pete and Sandy Oberhauser, who are representing all of the volunteers in one of the citizen science projects that I'll talk a little bit about, the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. But these citizen scientists are people all over the country, plus in Canada and Mexico, who have helped us understand monarchs by collecting data on them and, and making detailed observations in their backyards and at nature centers and, and wherever they are. So I'd really like to thank citizen scientists. Now, if I were with you, I would ask you to raise your hand and tell me if you've ever participated in a citizen science project, but I hope that some of you have. So I'm going to start by talking about monarchs' life history, and they have a very complex and amazing life history. And this would be where you'd have a lot of questions if we were together in the same room. So again, if you have questions, maybe jot them down while you're listening and feel free to email me with them. So I'm gonna start with the individual life cycle of monarchs. And this is what an individual monarch goes through during the course of its life. It starts, of course, as an egg. And monarchs are eggs for about four to five days under normal summer conditions. Then it becomes a larva or a caterpillar. And they're caterpillars for nine to 13 days. It's longer if it's cool, shorter if it's warm. But again, under normal summertime conditions, it's about nine to 13 days. And then there are chrysalis or a pupa. And the pupa is about one day less than the larva stage under the same conditions. And this is a very beautiful stage of the life cycle. Um, you can see there's a little egg up here in the corner of this leaf. I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, but there's a little egg just to the right of where the chrysalis is. And so you can kind of see the egg is about the size of a pinhead. The chrysalis is about an inch and a half long. And then they're an adult and they have different lifespans as an adult, depending on when they're alive. So the monarchs that you would be seeing right now, now you'll probably be watching this just about when monarchs are coming back to Wisconsin, will live about two to six weeks as adults. But then the last generation of the summer, the ones that migrate to Mexico, live eight to 10 months. And they don't reproduce until the end of, that, of their 
um, uh, the end of the winter. So they spend the fall and winter being non-reproductive. So that's why they can live a lot longer because they're not putting a lot of energy into reproduction. So that's the individual life cycle. And what monarchs need during the course of their life is as caterpillars, they need milkweed. So we often think of just a few kinds of milkweed, but there are actually over a hundred milkweed species that are native to North America. Um, with, we have kind of divided the country up into different zones, depending on what kind of milkweed grows in each of them. And I'm just gonna name these species starting from the top right species. And this might be what you think about when you think about milkweed. This is common milkweed or Asclepias syriaca. It has these beautiful pink flowers and you might think of it as kind of a weed, but I hope that you go out and smell those flowers sometime. They just have an amazing smell. So that's the common milkweed. And then if we go clockwise from that, so underneath that, the one on the far right hand is swamp milkweed. Um, again, it has a beautiful smell. It's native to Wisconsin. You've probably seen it. It's a great garden plant if you have some sunny, wet areas. Um, it also has, um, attracts lots and lots of pollinators to it. So this is a real favorite among a lot of different butterflies and bees. Then we have butterfly weed, which is also native to Wisconsin, the orange flowered one on the bottom. That's Asclepias tuberosa. And then to the left of that is a milkweed species that grows in Arizona. This is why we have Arizona as its own special zone. This is called desert milkweed, Asclepias subulata. And if you look at this one, that's not a monarch caterpillar, that's a queen caterpillar uh, of the a closely related species. But the reason I put this picture of the caterpillar in is to show you that this plant has hardly any leaves at all, and the caterpillars just eat the stems. And then moving around the circle to the far left-hand one, this is green milkweed, Asclepias verticillata, um, excuse me, Asclepias viridis, the kind of these green flowers here. This grows in the south central part of the country. And then the upper left one is showy milkweed, Asclepia speciosa, which grows in the western part of the country. It actually gets over as far west as, or as far east as western Minnesota, but um, you probably don't see that anywhere, at least not very commonly in Wisconsin. And then the top middle species is a, is a really great one. This is Asclepias verticillata, or whorled milkweed, which is native to Wisconsin. It grows, if you ever go into little remnant goat prairies up on the bluffs, you'll see this one, Asclepias verticillata. It has these skinny little leaves that look almost like pine needles, but the caterpillars will still eat them. So this is just a smattering of all of the different milkweed species and monarchs will eat almost all of them. So they'll eat a lot of different milkweed species. The adult stage, so here um, I'm just going to point out if we were together, I would ask you to tell me which is the male and which is the female. So you can give yourself this little quiz while I'm talking. And then I will tell you the answer that the male monarch is the one on the right, and the male has these two dots on his hind wings. So you can just see some spaces where the vein on the butterfly's wing kind of widens out with these two dots. And that only the males have those spots. And if you look at the female on the left, it looks like the veins in her wings are a little bit wider than those on the male. They aren't really wider, it's just that she has more brown scales on the top of them. So she looks a little bit darker. There's, there's more brown scaling mixed in between these veins than the male has. But otherwise they look pretty similar, the two sexes of monarchs. And when they're adults, monarchs get nectar from a lot of different species of flowers. So it's not just milkweed, they will nectar from milkweed but um, they actually will use lots and lots of different species, which is the case for most butterflies, as a matter of fact. So I'm gonna start here with the lilac, and I always show this picture because I wanna point out that while I focus and really emphasize native plants, lilacs are not native, and I know that, um, but 
Lilacs are a great species. Um, you'll often see monarchs on lilacs. And when they come back in the spring, that's often one of the few things that's blooming. So it's good to have monarchs in your yard if, if you're trying to attract monarchs, or excuse me, lilacs, if you're trying to attract monarchs. And then we kind of, what we need is nectar for monarchs during the whole time that they're in the area. So I kind of go through the season here, um, kind of early summer, uh, late June, July, we have echinacea or coneflower. That's the second one to the right of the lilac. And then going around, here's a monarch on bee balm, um, monarda, and this is joe pie weed getting more towards the end of the summer. You can see a lot of monarchs actually in this joe pie weed picture. Um, this is black-eyed Susan. Uh, this is New England aster. They really like all the aster species. And this one, we caught a bee on that flower as well. So that's great to show that the flowers are good for lots of other species besides just monarchs. And then towards the end of the season, we get the blazing stars of the liatris. Again, you can see quite a few monarchs. On this blazing star, they love this um, particular species of blazing star. So they'll get nectar from a lot of different flowers. So now I'm gonna switch over to the annual cycle of monarchs. And this is what makes monarchs so exciting to a lot of people. So just like in the individual life stage, they have um, four different parts. I think of the annual cycle as also having four parts, migrating south. And this is what you see in this map. So this happens in the fall, starting in the middle of August or so. Monarchs from Wisconsin and everywhere around us fly south following these, they, they don't follow specific pathways. You can just kind of think of a wave of monarchs moving south. And they funnel through Texas into central Mexico. There are some monarchs east of the Appalachian Mountains that travel along the Gulf Coast and, and then along the coast in, in Texas and join the rest of the monarchs from the upper Midwest. We think that some of those butterflies just miss this turn to the west and actually end up in the bottom of Florida where they have a continuously breeding population. There's a separate population of monarchs that lives west of the Rocky Mountains. We call this the Western population. These monarchs winter along the coast of California, but we do know that some of the monarchs from west of the Rockies move into Mexico, and that's represented by the dotted line here. And those monarchs do join the monarchs at the overwintering sites in Mexico. So there's not a, it's not a perfect divide between these two different populations. Then their overwintering stage, they just stay at these sites in Mexico. They start arriving there in late October, early November. They stay at these sites in Mexico. And about the middle of March, those same butterflies start their return flight. So it's the same butterflies that have been there all winter, the ones that live eight to 10 months. They fly into northern Mexico and into the southeastern quarter of the United States. They're repopulating this area, laying eggs along the way, and they keep moving north. And right now, I'm, I'm giving this talk at the last day of April, April 30th, pretty much all of these monarchs have died. They've, they've reached the end of their lifespan, and it's their offspring that are starting to move north. So the kind of see the broken arrows here that are moving into the north. That's what's happening right now. I'll show you this movement in a couple slides. But these butterflies are recolonizing their breeding range. They'll go through two to three non-migratory generations that just stay up here and lay eggs and breed. And then the last cycle or the last generation starts the cycle over. So then we start with this migrating south again. Now, one of the reasons that we can understand what's going on with monarch populations is because they are together in these overwintering sites at the end of the fall. And this means that we can really gauge how the population is doing. So in Mexico, we measure the area that the monarchs are occupying, and I'll show you a graph of this. So we measure how many hectares of land are covered with trees that are covered with monarchs in Mexico. 
And in California, people actually count them. So they estimate the actual numbers of monarchs in California along this coast. Now I'm gonna be focusing on the Eastern population, but if you have questions that you'd like to send me about the Western population, I, I won't say much more about them in this talk, but I'm happy to answer any questions. They're very interesting and I follow them closely. But because we see these Eastern monarchs here in Wisconsin, I'll focus on those. So just to kind of give you an idea of what monarchs need during each of these stages, I put a few pictures up here of each stage. This is migrating south. As they're migrating south, they need to eat nectar. Um, they, they have to eat along the way or they'd never make it all that way. So they need food and they stop in the evening. They don't migrate at night, so they stop in trees. Um, we'll often see trees just covered with monarchs along the migratory pathway. We saw a lot of this happening last fall in Wisconsin. Um, we had sites at the Arboretum that looked like this. This picture was actually taken in Texas, but it happens up here as well. When they're in Mexico, they just need a safe place to stay. Um, these monarchs on the right picture are just hanging in the tree for most of the time. They just hang there while they're in Mexico, but you do see these big flights like you see in the the picture on the left here of the butterflies flying in the sky. Then as they're moving north, again, I show the lilac picture here. Um, they need nectar again, because these are butterflies. They've lived a long time. They need to eat to stay alive. And they're basically moving north with milkweed. So here's a female laying an egg on a little tiny milkweed plant. This picture was taken in Oklahoma. And she's just moving north. As the milkweed moves north, she's moving north with it. And when they get up here during the summer where they go through these two to three non-migratory populations, the population just builds up. So they're not having to move. They're not having to invest a lot of energy in movement so they can lay more eggs. Um, there, there are fewer risks that they have to undertake because they're not traveling as far. So this is when the population is really building up. And then the cycle starts again. So again, up here, they need nectar plants and milkweed. So this is a chain and we need, a, a, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And all of these things, things have to be happening for the monarch population to survive. But whenever I go to Mexico and look at the monarchs in the trees, I think of everything they've had to go through to get through, to get there and of where they came from. And the vast majority of these monarchs in Mexico came from milkweed plants up here, came from milkweed plants in our backyards and our fields and roadsides in the upper Midwest. So this is really the basis of this chain is the milkweed plants up here. And here you see a big caterpillar on a swamp milkweed plant. So one of the reasons that, that you invited me here to talk with you and that you're listening to this talk is because you probably really like monarchs. And monarchs are a very iconic species. They're the symbol of a lot of conservation efforts. Um, this um, logo up here is from the Commission on Environmental Cooperation. You can see the butterflies on that. This is a joint Canada, Mexico, US project. Um, people just love monarchs. They're an iconic species. They're the state insect or butterfly of more than 10% of the states in the United States. And here we have all the states listed. Um, this was our proclamation when I was living in Minnesota. I was kind of involved with this, getting monarchs, the state butterfly of Wisconsin. Here you can see our proclamation that was signed in 1998 by our then governor, Jesse Ventura. I don't know if you remember him, but he was pretty big news all over the country. Um, so anyway, really iconic species that people celebrate. And this was a big thing that happened. This was now back in 2014, so it's been six years since this happened. But there was a meeting with President Obama. Um, in the middle is President Peña Nieto of Mexico and Prime Minister Harper of Canada. And those three guys met in Toluca, Mexico, and there were a lot of things they didn't agree about. They didn't agree about, at that time, the Keystone Pipeline was big news, immigration, free trade, all of these things were disagreements about among, among those three 
leaders of our continent. But one thing they agreed on was to create a working group to study how to protect the monarch butterfly. And that was very, very important for monarch conservation efforts in the United States because President Obama came back to Washington. He signed a memorandum of um, understanding that said all federal agencies had to work on monarch conservation. And that meant that there was a lot of federal engagement and that filtered down to the states. So that was a very, very important event, that, that agreement among those three leaders. Another thing that represents or that illustrates our, um, our desire to, to be involved with monarchs is the fact that we have all of these citizen science projects. And you don't need to memorize any of these. The point is, this is a long list. So over on the right here are all these programs. The top six or so of them are butterfly monitoring programs, but then we have a lot of monarch specific programs where citizen scientists go out and monitor monarchs. And they're doing this through all of the stages. So we've got the fall migration, arrival in Mexico, the spring migration, the breeding period. Monarchs are being monitored by people going out and volunteering their time. So you can see all these different projects correspond to different stages of the life cycle. And I'm just gonna show you one example of this. So I just downloaded this map right before I, I got online here. And this map is showing you where monarchs are right now. Now you're gonna hear this talk in a couple weeks, so they will have moved farther. But as of today, April 30th, this is where monarchs are. And this is from a program called Journey North, which is a program that we house at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Arboretum. So this is an Arboretum project, but we're engaging people. Each one of these dots represents somebody spotting their first monarch of the year. And the different colors of dots correspond to different two-week time periods. So here's how far monarchs, monarchs have just reached. This farthest north one is in Indiana. Um, there's one up here, a little bit above St. Louis in, in Western Illinois. So these are the furthest they've gotten so far, but we we're tracking this migration. And the, the dots that have a little black or a little white square in the middle of them mean that there's a picture. So let's see if I can get that. Yeah, I, I downloaded this picture. So this picture was taken on April 27th. This is this monarch in Indiana. And this is a woman that saw this is on her, um, her this is a flox plant that's growing in her garden. So we have a record of this butterfly and maybe you're looking at that and saying that's a guess, is it a male or a female? It's a male, you can see the little dots on his hind wings. So it's fun, you can just click on these, go to the website journeynorth.org and you can track the monarchs coming north. And just to kind of show you what happened last year, this is last year, um, I couldn't download this because I can't see into the future, but this is the sightings from last year so you can see how you can track them going north. So if you're excited after hearing this talk and want to see where the monarchs are now, just go to journeynorth.org and you can find the map really easily and, and see where they are now while, while you're, you're um, watching me, right when you're done. We also track them going north or going south in the fall. So this is the fall migration from last year. Um, here you can see them moving. Further south, you kind of see the monarchs tracking along the coast, the east coast of the United States, along the Gulf Coast, and joining this big wave of them that are coming from the upper Midwest. And again, there are pictures, so I downloaded one. This is a picture that somebody took right near the Capitol in Madison. So here you see a whole bunch of monarchs in a tree. So this is one of these um, dots that has a, a white square in the middle. So we can track them as they're going south as well. So that's just an example of how much we can learn from citizen scientists and you would all be welcome to go out. You're gonna see this talk right before monarchs are coming into Wisconsin. So if you see a monarch, report it to Journey North. We would love to have you join this project. 
People are also collecting data and on monarch breeding and providing breeding habitat for monarchs. So all of these pictures represent different kinds of breeding habitat. The upper left-hand picture is at a nature center. Um, you can see they put up a sign that shows that this is a monarch way station. This is somebody's backyard. Um, in this backyard, they had a sign that they were taking part in the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, which is a project that I started over 25 years ago. And this project is also now run at least partly out of the, the Arboretum. Um, on the bottom right is a picture at a um, national forest in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And this is another picture in Wisconsin. This is in New London, Wisconsin. And I put this quote from the woman that monitors this site because it really illustrates how much people learn when they do these citizen science projects. So this is an old field in New London. And this picture was taken, I believe, in 2018. But she said it was the best milkweed she'd seen here since 2005. So there's been lots of rain, lots of sun, and lots of heat. And it's a great field of milkweed this year. So people are really noticing what kinds of conditions are good for monarchs. So that's kind of um, il illustrates the interest that people have in monarchs and, and how much they're doing for them. But despite this, monarch numbers are declining. And I told you that um, we have, that we count the area of monarchs. We, we look at how much area monarchs occupy in Mexico. Um, we have this overall downward trend in winter area with lots and lots of year-to-year -year variation. So you see good years, 20, or 1996, the winter that started in 96 was a good year. Um, they went down a lot the next year, lots and lots of up and downs. But you can see that the trend is going downward. Um, actually, 2019 is missing. We do have the data now from 2019. 2019 was... 2.6 hectares. So it was about half, a little less than half of what it was last year. But you can see last year we had a bit of a recovery. We had a really low year in 2013. But on average, it's going down. And what we can do is actually look at decade trends. So the average over the last decade is 2.7 hectares. Again, we were down to about that in 2019. But the average for the decade before this was 6.4 hectares. So the population is declining. Again, we have this year-to-year -year variation that's mostly due to weather, but there's an underlying driver that's making the population go down. So we have done some analyses about what's causing this. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this because it's kind of complicated mathematical models. But in one paper that I was a co-author on, um, it was led by Wayne Thogmartin, who's a USGS biologist. Um, he's headquartered in Wisconsin, actually. We looked at all different factors, climate factors, habitat-related factors, and anything else that we could measure that we thought might be influencing monarch population sizes from year to year. And what we found were that the most important drivers, the most important things that were associated with monarch numbers from year to year had to do with the habitat that was available to them and the climate. So I'm putting a map up here because it, climate in different areas can be important in different ways. But I'm gonna start with the top thing on the list. The biggest driver for monarch numbers was glyphosate use. So glyphosate is Roundup. The reason that glyphosate is important is because there actually used to be quite a lot of milkweed growing in corn and soybean fields, but that's gone because now farmers can spray their fields with Roundup. Um, the crops have been genetically modified to be able to tolerate the glyphosate, but the milkweed can't. So it's gone from these fields. Um, so that is a big driver, the loss of milkweed in in agricultural habitat. And so that tells us what we need to make up for. Other things that were important were temperature conditions 
in the north central United States. So that's why I have this map here. So this is this yellow area on the map. And this little negative space line right here means that if you have high temperatures in August, if, if you have high minimum temperatures, so the low, the minimum temperatures are high, means you're having a hot August, you have low monarch numbers. So hot conditions are bad for monarchs in the north central region in August. And also another important driver is also a, a negative association between warm temperatures and, and monarch numbers. If you have a lot of warm days in this north central region in early May, so if we have a hot spring, we also have negative, we have a negative impact on monarch numbers. So basically the loss of habitat due to um, herbicides being used in cornfields and soybean fields and hot temperatures are, mean we have bad numbers for monarchs. So that's kind of, this just summarizes what I said. The loss of breeding habitat and hot water, weather are bad for monarchs. Now there are a lot of other drivers. Um, so these were the, just the things that showed up in most of our models, but we know that we're losing a lot of habitat in Mexico as well. So we're losing big trees are being cut down. The government, the, this land is protected by the government, but there still is some logging going on. Um, we're losing big areas. So the mountain here in this upper right-hand picture was logged off. Um, about 20 or so, even more years ago, th almost 30 years ago now. This land was logged off um, and some of the trees are growing back, but it's still not good for monarchs, but there used to be monarchs wintering here. There's some small scale logging going on. In this bottom right hand or left hand picture, you can see that the trees are being cut down right where the monarchs are. I hope you can see that there are monarchs flitting around in this picture. So there are a lot of other things going on, but the most important things are breeding habitat loss and weather. So how do we use this information to stop the declining numbers of monarchs? So what are our strategies for stopping this decline in monarchs? And here you can see a little monarch caterpillar chewing its way through this milkweed leaf. So, one way to think about that, I, I'm going to focus on the habitat issues and not the climate issues right now. Um, you know, climate is something that we, we know what we need to do to stop climate change. So I'm going to work on what we need to do to provide monarchs with more habitat. So one way to think about that is to um, look at the different possibilities for where we can find habitat. So one is urban and suburban spaces. And this was my backyard when I used to live near the University of, of Minnesota um, in, in St. Paul. This was my yard. Um, there were a lot of monarchs there. They, they loved it. Um, basically, it was a prairie. And here you can see one of the monarchs that came to my yard one of the fa last falls I lived there. Unfortunately, this is what a lot of our urban and suburban spaces look like. Um, this is not good habitat for monarchs. This is not really good habitat for anything in this picture. So what we need to think about is how we can make these areas um, more hospitable to monarchs. Um, I took this particular picture in Kalamazoo, Michigan, but I'm sure you've seen places that look like this. We also have agricultural set-aside land. So this is land that's um, set aside from farming and is used maybe CRP land, Conservation Reserve Program land. And here you can see there's a cornfield growing here, but next to it is this area. Now there are risks because there are pesticides sprayed in here, but in an area where there's so much corn growing, this, this I took this picture in Iowa, um, sometimes this is the best that we can do. Um, there might be some pesticide drift, but some monarchs will survive in these conditions. Um, this is also good in controlling ro erosion. Um, so there are a lot of benefits to having some, some set aside land amongst our agricultural crops. And here's a picture of this, this is called the Prairie Strips Program. 
um, here you can see soybean fields with these prairie um, plantings in between them. And this is a big, really being promoted in Iowa right now. Um, this was published last, uh, what did I say, June of 2019. So here you can see um, the, these strips programs where they're putting um, habitat in between the crop rows. Another great option is rights of way. So this is a road right of way. This is in, in Minnesota. Um, here you can see the land right next to the highway is being uh, mown because there are, again, there are a lot of toxins and things that come from the cars. Um, it needs to be mowed often for safety, but any of the other right of way areas, great. This can be railroad rights of ways, roads, utility rights of ways, anywhere there's this linear habitat is actually good for monarchs and other species because they can use this to travel through to get to bigger habitat areas. So rights of ways are another option we can use. Um, we have to watch that we don't put a lot of milkweed where it's going to be mown because that can kill the monarchs that are using the milkweed, but using that land between um, the fields or, or whatever's on the other side of the right of way and where that has to be mowed for safety is a good option for habitat. Then the protected lands. There's a lot of land that's already protected. Um, it's not being used for other things, so making that into better monarch habitat and habitat for other critters is important too. This is a natural, a national grassland. One problem, oh yeah, so then I'm gonna move on to the last, um, the last kind of land that we can use. So we've got the, the urban and suburban spaces, the protected land and agricultural areas, the rights of ways, um, the set aside land and agriculture, there's also marginal land, and this is land that is being farmed. Um, you can see this driving around. Um, I see this on my way to Baraboo sometimes, um, fields that have been flooded in the spring. So you might be seeing this right now. So this was a cornfield. This corn is not going to produce corn this year. The water sat there for a long time. Um, so this is land that in a lot of years doesn't produce a good crop, farmers are still farming it because they can get insurance for this once they've planted it. But we could use this as set aside land and it would, it would increase the amount of, of area that's available for monarchs and, and other species. So I want to end this monarch portion of the talk just saying that a, a lot of people say to me sometimes, do you, have, do you have hope or do you just feel hopeless about the situation? And I am hopeful because of this list. And this list is all of these different organizations and efforts across the breeding range. So we have international efforts that are North American efforts. We have efforts in Mexico, efforts in the US and in Canada that are focused on monarch conservation. And I just wanna highlight one, the Monarch Joint Venture, which is a collaborative effort of many different organizations. We're actually almost up to 90 organizations that are promoting monarch conservation in the US. And this picture shows the logos from these organizations and what I did here is I circled the ones that are in Wisconsin because we're really doing a lot in Wisconsin. Um, the Arboretum is a member of the joint venture. Here's Journey North is here, the Natural Resources Foundation, which some of you might be familiar with, the Sand County Foundation, our DNR, and Wild Ones are all Wisconsin organizations that are just doing so much to promote monarch conservation, but we have a lot of other groups. So, this kind of collaboration and this kind of grassroots efforts with people everywhere from great big federal agencies like the National Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, down to small local organizations, a nature center in Cincinnati. Um, all these organizations are working together for monarch conservation and that's what gives me hope. So what can you do to help monarchs? There's really four different things. You can create habitat. You can, if you have any control over land, you can put some habitat in there, milkweed and nectar plants and, 
and think of all the other critters as well that can use this habitat. You can become a monarch citizen scientist. You can go out and the first monarch you see this year, you can report it to Journey North. You can join. There's a lot of information about monarch citizen science programs. You can support conservation organizations. Any organization that's working on preserving habitat is going to be helping monarchs. And you can use what you're learning here today from me to spread the word, talk to your friends and neighbors, and maybe this talk will be available. You can say, go to the Bear Boo Boo Library and, and see this talk that'll tell you what you can do for monarchs. So lots and lots of different things you can do to help them. I'm just gonna end with a few slides talking about my connection with Monarchs Now and how one organization is working to do the things that will help monarchs and other organizations or other species. So um, I don't know how many of you have been to the, to the UW Madison Arboretum. Um, if I were there, I would ask you to raise your hand. But a lot of people were surprised because my whole career has been focused on monarch butterflies and they kept saying when I took this job at Madison, How, what are you gonna do um, without being able to work on monarchs? This quote is from Aldo Leopold at the dedication of the Arboretum. Um, it says, this in a nutshell is the function of the Arboretum, a reconstructed sample of old Wisconsin to serve as a benchmark, a starting point, in the long and laborious job of building a permanent and mutually beneficial relationship between civilized men and a civilized landscape. So this is what we need more of to provide habitat for all the species that can't live in where a lot, what we're doing to a lot of the land. So having this, what we call a reconstructed sample of old Wisconsin is really an important way to rebuild these connections that we need between people and the natural landscape. Our mission at the Arboretum, we kind of have three, a threefold mission. We conserve and restore Arboretum lands. So we are restoring habitat for monarchs and other organisms. To advance restoration ecology, so we're doing the science that's needed and to foster the land ethic. And that means fostering these connections between people and the land so that they'll go out and make wise decisions. So all of these things that we're doing at the Arboretum are benefiting the natural world, monarchs, and all of these other organisms. So monarchs need habitat, we just learned that. And the Arboretum itself, is 1,200 acres of land in Madison. And, and here you see a, an aerial view of this. This is Lake Wingra with the downtown area of Madison in the background, the top part of that picture. But here's a map of the land we have at, at the Arboretum. And this is land right in the city that provides habitat for so many different organism, organisms. We also have habitat in outlying properties. We have an additional 513 acres and 11 different outlying properties. So here we have, um, a lot of these are not too far from where you are in Baraboo. Um, a lot of our outlying properties, 10 of them are down in the southern part of the state and then way up here, Finnerud Forest, which is near Manaqua in the north. So these range in size from just three acres to the one up here at Finnerud is 141 acres. So we're protecting a lot of other habitat besides the land right in Madison. We have these garden collections which, which are great habitat and they also bring a lot of people to the land to, to learn about what they can do on their own properties. So we have the Langenecker Horticultural Garden, which is a 35 acre garden. I'm sure many of you have been here. We have um, lots and lots of trees and shrubs. Basically, if it can grow in Wisconsin, we have it at the Arboretum. And then a native plant garden around the building. And then another a viburnum garden along Manitou Way, a road in Madison. But I just want to point out that these garden areas are the pink areas on the map. So here's the viburnum garden over here on the west side, um, long um, Manitou Way. 
Um, this is the Longenecker garden, this big pink area right in the middle, and then the pink um, native plant garden right around our visitor center. But the rest of the land is managed to be more like the natural condition of the land. So the vast majority of our land is managed for natural ecosystems and natural communities. And our focus on restoration um, is, is really important because we've lost a lot of land. Um, we've lost land that can be restored back to habitat for other organisms. And the Arboretum is the birthplace of the field of restoration ecology. We actually have the first restored prairie in the world, Curtis Prairie, which is right just south of our visitor center. Um, native prairie plants were first planted in Curtis Prairie in 1936. And this is now 60 acres of what had been an overgrazed pasture. And this is what Curtis Prairie looks like now. Um, it's an important place for learning about the science of restoration because it is the oldest restoration in the world. So people come here to understand what can happen with restorations when you give them enough time. And I, I'm gonna just kind of end, this is right before my last slide, but I, I think that this quote from a book that I, I just read and, and just love called Miracle Under the Oaks, um, I, I think this is really inspirational. It's no longer content to try to hold the line in an often losing attempt to protect nature Conservationists are at last moving from the defensive to the offensive. I, I just love that line, that we're not just trying to be defensive and protect a little bit of land, but we're, being, we're going on the offense and rebuilding what's been lost. Um, they are striking back and restoration is their tool. Restoration makes it possible to go beyond preserving what remains of nature to re-expand this reach. And that's really what we're working to do at the Arboretum and promoting this all over the world by promoting the science of restoration ecology. We're also doing a lot of citizen science. So I mentioned some of the Monarch programs, but we are engaging the public in this data collection. And I just put a list here, it's not even a comprehensive list of the different things we're monitoring. We're monitoring invasive species. You might have heard of invasive Asian jumping worms, a lot of native species, bumblebees, dragonflies, monarchs, birds, bats, frogs and toads. We have Snapshot Wisconsin sites, which are trail cameras that collect pictures of organisms that are moving through the Arboretum and Journey North, which I already talked about. So we're really, promoting this engagement, so building the science and building people's engagement in science at the same time. So really, monarchs are on this, in this sweet spot of what we're doing at the Arboretum. They really benefit from the land care that we do, the research that's going on, and our education and outreach. So we'll put this little part in the middle of here that it's just one example of how we combine our work in so many different areas. So with that, I'll just say that um, while I've focused on monarchs, really monarchs are just a, a, a kind of a representative of what's going on in the natural world. They exist in this amazing mosaic of rare and pristine habitats like like remnant prairies. We have hardly any of our remnant prairies left. They're the rarest of habitats. But they're also in common and disturbed habitats, like they used to be in cornfields when there was milkweed in cornfields. So the, this whole spectrum of habitats are shared with many other species. So when we protect these habitats for monarchs, we're helping a lot of other species at the same time. I find them an incredibly interesting organism. Um, we still have a lot to learn from monarchs. So what we learn about saving monarchs will help with other species. And finally, their migration that I just barely touched on today. But the migration of monarchs is an unmatched phenomenon. There is not anything like it in the world. Um, they migrate more like birds and mammals do in this really regular pattern that other insects don't do. So it's just that, that they have this 
incredible migration that we can learn so much from and be inspired by. So with that, I'll end. I've put my email address up here on this slide. Um, I know you can't ask me questions in person, but I'm really happy to answer your emails. Um, just let me know that you heard this presentation and um, I'd be happy to, to take your virtual questions. So thank you so much for listening and for all that you're doing. Thank you.